find a fish. Somewhere down in this canyon, we will find the native cutthroat, maybe. We look hard. <laughs> Great job. And I see it suck the wind a little bit. Eat rookies. There's a lot of cool rocks down here. The limestone formations. Ancient can hear those waterfalls from here. Almost there. Almost where the cutties are. Oh yeah. Check this out, Ariel and Chetco. Ha <laughs> ha! Sometimes one finds oneself in a perfect world. And for me, an angler that loves wild and native places, this stream, high in the Bighorn Mountains in northeast Wyoming, near where I grew up, is just about as perfect of a world as I'll ever find. Here is a perfect habitat for native Yellowstone cutthroat trout. Follow me as we explore the deep canyons where these things have made a living since the last ice age. As a matter of fact, I think I can find one right below me. A little bamboo rod, a little stick for the dog to chew on. Dry fly tied with elk hair. Great overhanging limestone formation hanging over the water itself. The creek is actually cutting underneath the canyon right here. Carving a nice pool home. For the cutthroat trout, like this beautiful fish, fish hanging right in the tail of the pool. Wow. Came up and just nailed. Caddis imitation. Look at that, huge round spots concentrated towards the tail, very indicative of the Yellowstone Cuddy. Thanks, buddy. That was perfection. Ariel, Checko, come here. Good dogs. Man, it takes a lot of work to cut through all the vegetation, really. A small world for these native trout to live in. This is all we left them. Much below this canyon, and it's all non-native, invasive trout species. Rainbows and browns. And they just don't compete well. The cutthroat don't compete well with them. Just trying to look for what's left of these Yellowstone cutthroat. And honestly, there isn't much, not in their native water. I know there are cutthroat in these pools, but really tough to get up into the surface. We've got a caddis dry on. Caddis are a very common insect in this stream. So you got a high vis caddis dry tied up. There's a lot of caddis in this creek, so I this is a popular fly. It can look like a stone fly, can look like a caddis. I put a bright green caddis larva as a dropper with a tungsten bead. That black bead there is super heavy and it'll sink down through a lot of these faster pockets. There's a little secret hiding spot that cutthroat trout often have in these kinds of streams that cascade through canyons. And I'll show that to you right after this. This boulder is looking particularly good. There's an overhanging willow, huge boulders, undercut boulders even. And I got a hiding spot on the upstream side and this water is so crystal clear. 
think I was sticking out a little bit too much. Boom, there we go. All right. Right in the middle of the pool, just letting it drift down. An upstream presentation. Not many anglers do this, and I've even read some articles that say you should never do this. Uh, but the truth be told, it works for me. I know you want it. There we go. Oh. Right out from the willow. I finally got into the right spot. You know, and it's funny. I would almost swear it'd be up in these bubbles, but this one came out from the shadow underneath the willows. It's looking like this woody debris is gonna be a little bit more important. And you know what? I think the reason is the sunshine. That one fish just came out of that shadow. And there's nothing where the sun hits the bottom of the stream channel. Absolutely nothing where I would have caught it. I'm gonna get out of here and keep fishing my way downstream. See if I can fool something hiding in the shadows. Like that rock. Looks fishy. It's real fishy. In the mountains here in the Bighorns, it's very sterile. You don't see much for moss or anything on the rocks. And there really is just barely enough production to keep life alive. The water's cold, the production's low of algae, so it's not a whole lot of primary consumers in the ecosystem. It's a tough river to live in. Cutthroat have done it since the last, since the glaciers retreated 12,000 years ago. But it's not easy. Definitely not easy. Difficult living for the native cutthroat trout. Missed that one. Difficult living. So difficult they don't even know how to hold on to my fly. Oh, heartbreaker. All right, we're getting it though. There we go, right in the surface on a dry fly. Something's going on. I put on an ant pattern. And we have some dry fly action once again, but on an ant, Ariel, come here girl, check this fish out. What do you think of this little native Yellowstone cutthroat? Smashing a dry fly, you can see beautiful, bright, healthy fish, but there aren't many of them left in the stream. And so to find that one cutthroat, this far in the remote wilderness, and for it to eat an ant. A variety of insects out here for him to eat. Ant and the cat seem to be the key. But I do remember, a buddy of mine tell me when we surveyed this, Phil Depke, he happened to mention there's a pond that this river leads to, and something about fish that survive in this beautiful little gravel pit. They get a little bit bigger than that one, and they're native. I think the dogs and I are gonna go check this out. Ariel, let's go check this pond that Phil was talking about. You think it's a good idea? All right, come on, let's go find it. Here's something I saw quite a bit of in the Bighorn National Forest. It kind of breaks my heart and it's a, a broken bank. I don't mean a piggy bank. I don't mean your bank that charges you a great interest rate on your credit card, but these uh, unstable banks are a cause of sedimentation in a stream channel. What happens is they start to slough off and become unstable, cause a lot of mud to cover up the gravel and it'll fill in the spawning reproduction possibility for native fish, trout primarily. And then you'll see a lot of this is all grasses, an invasive species like the dandelion. And the problem is that their root mass is super shallow. It's not as deep as a root mass as the native sedges that should be in the riparian area. And so this will just keep sloughing off. But the more unstable bank you see in a stream channel, the wider, shallower, and muddier the stream's gonna get. And it becomes not a good home for trout. This is a bad sign. Well, did manage to find a few of my cutthroat that are still left over from the, since the days when I surveyed it, and actually since the days of the last ice age. They're here, 
population sparse, but they're healthy and they are surviving. That's important to me. One thing I do remember in the days of surveying of Mr. Phil Depke is that uh, there's this little pond. It used to be a gravel pit filled in with water. Somehow trout got in there, native trout, isolated and alone in a pond that is rarely visited by any hominid, homo sapien. Never see it. It's about time. Dogs and I go and check this thing out. This probably is it. Been wandering around the valley looking for additional sources of water following this little tributary up here. And what I've got is a big dike and a pipe leaking out water. And to me, this is a sure sign of a pond. Whether it's the right pond or not, who knows? Um, looks like someone's trying to post part of it as theirs. Everyone wants a little piece of water and some good fishing, I understand. But um, I actually see the original fence there. And all I gotta do now is walk up over the dam and see what these rumors actually are all about. Who's there? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, that's one thing about walking in felt boots. They're not always the best on wet grass. <laughs> I don't care. Can't hurt steel. <laughs> oh. Oh, and there it is. This is a great looking pond and there's a fish rising. If only you could see what I'm looking at now. <laughs> there it is. It is just a little pond. You can see how it was kind of dug out. It'll be interesting to see if, well, I saw a fish rise. Who knows what kind? And then my wonderful fishing dogs, Ariel and Checo, decided to go for a swim. They're hot, I understand that. But uh, we'll see if whatever's in there, what it is, and if it's still gonna bite. I can't help, I, got, I still have that ant, and I've got a little aquatic beetle tied on. I'm just gonna go right after it. I can't hold back any longer. Come here, little fishy fishy of the pond. It's super shallow out here, but it looks like they're feeding in about one foot of water. And if I could cast out to that one foot of water, instead of getting snagged on the grass behind me, that would be great. All right, here we go. We're, and I'm putting a little bit of motion on it. I got a struggling ant, ah, and a struggling aquatic beetle. And that's what it took first was my subsurface fly. A little soft tackle, peacock bodied, bead head wet fly. Real classic fly. Some weeds here I gotta navigate. Oh, what is this? It's an aggressive feeding fish. Oh, and it's a cuddy. Quite obviously a cuddy. Oh, brilliant and speckled. Probably about a six or seven year old fish in water this high up in elevation in this this, uh, this cold, this long. It's not liquid water for very long, at least not in the surface. I'm gonna get him right back in the water. And uh, this cutty's gonna go back and somehow reproduce in a pond. I wanna, I wanna take a closer look at this and see how a fish, this is a re reproduced fish, wild fish. It was born here. And right now I don't see any sign of how that could happen. That's another mystery it's gonna be to solve. <laughs> There we go. Oh, popped it and missed it. Oh, that's fun when they'll come up and hit those big kind of foam, that's big foam ant pattern. There's a rise off to the right. Boom, just to the left of it. Should be about right in line with the direction it's headed. You really, there we go. Yeah. Oh, 
you really got to put your uh, mindset, oh, as in to thinking more like an insect. <laughs> there's, a, there's a good example of your anaerobic stinky decomposition that happens when you fall into the water. Um, I think like an insect. I'm trying to, trying to picture myself being a bug and trying to get away from the fish. And I get so involved and so wrapped up in what I'm doing with my fly that sometimes I don't set the hook quite quick enough. But I'm getting reactions, I'm getting hits on the dry, I'm getting hits on the wet, and we're gonna get right back into them right here soon. Now I've got about 20 or 30 fish right out in front of me. This is unbelievable. Yellowstone cutthroat everywhere that have somehow been able to survive in this little tiny pond. But I am way above them. I'm just in a bad position to set the hook. They're hitting the fly probably about 10 feet above them and just having a very difficult time setting the hook. There, oh, man, I can't set the hook. That's interesting. It's like pulling the hook along the line of the water. She does give me a little bit better leverage. Hmm. This whole time I thought I could hunt like an osprey. I have to go back to just hunting like a regular old homo sapien. There we go. Line strike and a fish is on. Oh, did more of a line strike instead of lifting up with my rod to set the hook. I pulled in with the line, just like I'm stripping the line in. Real, real, real wild. I mean, native, but trapped in a little pond that used to be used just to wash gravel. There's a gravel pit, turn of the 20th century. And now it's home to native Yellowstone cutthroat. It's really quite fantastic how the mountains just taken over and turned it into a home for fish. Beautiful, wow, fat, yellowy, just gorgeous specimen. Mmm, mmm. You ever taste fish slime? It actually tastes interesting, like sweet. Fish slime tastes sweet. If you don't believe me, go kiss a fish. See if I care. <laughs> From a high perspective. Just feisty, beautiful. Oh, Yellowstone, cutthroat trout on a bamboo fly rod. All right, buddy. Ooh, wow, this is like a classic looking. Like if you were to look at a poster of a Yellowstone cutthroat, red line, green back, yellow belly, orange slashes. Beautiful, bud. MFC uh, little tool release. A little action coming in here. Slide it right down. Put the fly, twist, and she's gone. And that was right in the point of the jaw, so it was buried about as deep as a hook can get just by letting the fish flip a little bit. Using a little hook release tool, we'll go right away. Handy flyers me back in the saddle to go catch more fish, which is about what I'm going to go do right now. This is it. This tiny little stream channel is all the available flowing water 
that the trout, the cutthroat trout in this pond have to reproduce in. And not only is it a small section of stream that isn't very wide, it is spring fed, it's super cold, so it will keep the eggs reproducing throughout the year. They can spawn later if they need to. But this mud covers up the eggs and it'll, it'll suffocate them. It'll kill the eggs if the water flow is not high enough. That's why water flows and snowpack are so critical to keep in a stream channel. And as well as that, there's a lot of large substrate. There's a lot of big boulders and there's very little actual gravel. I had to dig around quite a bit and there is a little bit of this pea-ish and kind of bean-sized gravel. That's what they need to spawn in. The gravel allows the females to lay their fertilized eggs on top of the gravel. The eggs kind of fall and they'll be covered up from predation. And the, the moving water is critical because the moving water supplies oxygen to the growing embryo, the fertilized egg. And if they can't reach that gravel, if there's not enough water, they'll be extinct in this pond. So far they're holding on and they're doing okay. It makes me smile to see it. What an amazing day. I can't tell you, but well, hopefully you saw how satisfying it can be to go back and look at a stream that Phil and I documented just about every square centimeter of that stream bed we documented over a decade ago to come back and fish it and to see that it's a great and healthy fishery for native Yellowstone cutthroat. And then to come back and have a chance to check out these rumors about a pond supposedly having a few fish, who knows, and to find that it's also a reproducing population of kind of encapsulated native trout that kind of got stuck here and they're doing all right. They're living, they're reproducing, they're feeding, and they're doing just fine despite the trials of high elevation and a short growing season within a muddy pond. They're doing great with spring water, a little bit of a tributary, and the Yellowstone cutthroat are still doing well. And this is awfully a rare jewel. You just don't find places like this. And to be able to spend a day and have a wonderful time with the dogs, this is, this is what life's about, honestly.